Uh, some quick uh, news. Uh, as I think many of you have seen on the website, we have uh, gotten to a scale that this space is no longer uh, providing everyone with a seat. And so we'd love to see the excitement of people camped out on the staircase and in the balconies, and it creates a great rock star feel. But we're very pleased to say that we have secured a larger conference facility downstairs uh, in, here in the Mars building. And for those of you who remember, it was actually where Tuck started uh, four years ago, it was in the same space downstairs. Uh, and Autodesk Research was kind enough to pick up the tab for that additional space. So I'll say a quick thank you to Autodesk for that particular. Uh, and our first uh, talk in that space and the next talk will be on February 11th with Salima Mershi from Microsoft Research will be coming to, to speak to us. But today, I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Michelle baudin -Pont. I was just uh, speaking to Michelle about my Canadian French accent and how I feel self-conscious when I try to pronounce French words and I'll do my best as I motor along here. Uh, Professor baudouin Lafon uh, is a computer science professor, classe exceptionnelle at the Université du Paris-Sud in the south of Paris. Uh, and he is also a senior fellow at the Institut Universitaire de France. Uh, both of those are singular distinctions in French academia and represent the fact that he is among the senior echelon of academics in France. And of course, he is also among the senior echelon of academics in human-computer interaction worldwide. For the last 30 years, he has been conducting research in the area of human-computer interaction, and he has studied and conducted research in uh, the fundamentals, uh, aspects of interaction, novel interaction techniques, computer-supported cooperative work, and of course, the engineering of interactive systems, among many other things. On these and other topics, he has published over 180 peer-reviewed papers in the field, and is an ACM distinguished speaker. Uh, he is also among the many distinctions that he has carried out for the ACM. He has served as the technical program chair for the CHI conference, which is the major conference of our field, as we know. He was also inducted into the CHI Academy, the Sig Chi Academy, and has received an ACM Sig Chi Lifetime Service Award in 2015. Among many other distinctions that, of course, have uh, been formally bestowed, I think one of the things that makes uh, Michelle so special and important in my research and in the research that we tend to carry out in Toronto is that if you think about the list that I gave you a moment ago of his primary areas of research that include everything from engineering of interactive systems through to how do people cooperate with each other using technology through to interaction techniques, he is probably the single most uh, authoritative figure on the full stack of HCI. And I have tried to model my research programs in many ways after his example of recognizing that as Alan Kay said, that anyone who's really interested in designing software also has to design hardware. And I think that, that uh, Michelle has demonstrated how uh, very great HCI research really requires digging down right into the engineering layers of interactive systems. I know all of you will be as excited to hear from him uh, today as I am, and I'd like to welcome Michelle to the stage. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Daniel, for this introduction. Uh, the pack to follow. So, I really enjoy being here. Um, I have a long uh, history with, uh, with Toronto. Uh, I first came here uh, on the, my first sabbatical. Uh, I was back in 1992. I'm sure some people here were not born, so uh, this dates me. Uh, so, I see many uh, familiar faces in the crowd here. And uh, for me, DGP, where I went, where I came, uh, when uh, Bill Buxton was working on the telepresence project, uh, running the input group, was was a great influence in my in my research career to see how you can conduct uh, both uh, innovative and exploratory research in media spaces and stuff that you know still hasn't been replicated with the modern technology we have today for media communication, as well as. Uh, really fundamental research on, on, on input uh, uh, and uh, famous Fitz law that I'm sure all of you uh, know and cherish. Um, and so, you know, it, it's been always a pleasure to come back here and to, uh, to see how the field here has, has, uh, has developed. I, I visited the uh, lab this morning and there's others in the Autodesk and all that, so it's really great to see how strong HCI is, uh, is, uh, is in here. 
So I want to talk today about uh, work that we conducted mostly in the context of, uh, of a, a recent uh, European research grant, and it has this uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, ambitious title of uh, Unified Principles of Interaction. Uh, and I've always been interested in uh, uh, understanding what interaction is and understanding how we can give uh, not only what I call point designs of interesting things that we build that work and that people can then use, but also the principles to help people build new things. And I think this is really the message of this talk, is about trying to uh, dig deeper in the research we make to better understand what it is we're doing and how it can serve uh, others. So, um, one first observation is that you know the interaction uh, that we use today every day, that billions of users use every day, uh, is is not very new. Uh, the graphical user interfaces uh, was born in the in the early 80s. Uh, that's uh, the Xerox Star for those uh, of you who don't know this picture, uh, back in 1981. And so uh, 40 years later, uh, it's the same interface. Well, it's not exactly the same. It got color, uh, but that's pretty much it. And in fact, there are features in the Xerox Star that are not in today's interfaces. Um, and so every once in a while, we hear, OK, you know, GUIs are dead, WIMP is dead, the desktop uh, interaction is dead. Uh, and so we're all going to do touch-based interaction. And yes, we do a lot of touch interaction. Uh, but would you write your next Kai paper on a cell phone? We also use voice. Hey, Alexa, Siri, all these guys. Um, but would you write your next Sky paper with Alexa? I don't know. So I think these interaction styles are very rich, and they are very well adapted to some uh, interaction situations. When your hands are busy, for example, for vocal, or where you are on the move if you, if you interact with a smartphone. And then there are things like virtual reality. It's interesting how VR has come back. You know, 20 years ago, VR was this big thing, and then we didn't hear very much about it, and then the HMDs came uh, back affordable, and then suddenly uh, there's a lot of things that, that are interesting in VR. The thing that bothers me about all this is that we as researchers, we tend to focus on each of these styles and say, well, this is going to be the next big thing. Uh, and I know this is what we need to sell to uh, our students, uh, our uh, evaluation committee and all that, um, but I think there is a problem that we are uh, omitting is that uh, Together with these interaction styles, uh, I should have mentioned also tangible, augmented reality, and body interaction, all the research on these uh, specific interaction styles is, of course, most welcome, um, but none of them is going to replace the GUI. I'm sorry. Laptops will still be there 20 years from now and 30 years from, that, 30 years from now. Uh, so the real question is not what are we going to do to replace the GUI or touch interfaces or any one of those, but how can these interaction styles coexist? And not just coexist, because you could say nowadays they do coexist, but can enrich each other. How can I take something where I started with a voice interaction and then pick it up on my smartphone and then go to my laptop? And I don't think that as a community we have really uh, embraced that, that subject, uh, even though there is, of course, uh, work out there on trying to do, in fact, this morning we had the, uh, discussions about multi-device interaction, which is a, a, a tricky topic. But the question is, why, why aren't we better at uh, understanding interaction so that this uh, uh, mutual enrichment of interaction techniques and interaction styles uh, is, is a given rather than a, a still a challenge? So I think there are a number of issues with the way uh, interaction has developed over the years, uh, is now used by billions of people, uh, and I call that the walled gardens and uh, information silos. So I think these contribute to isolating interaction in silos and walled gardens, uh, making it very difficult to make them uh, coexist. So let's uh, make a little bit of history here about what it used to be like. Uh, email. You guys know email? Yeah? Some people still do email? Uh, I have students who tell me they only do email with their parents because... Uh, <laughs> um, so email, you know, all you need to communicate over email is an email address, right? And um, I can have uh, an account on my university, uh, a mail server, and uh, you may have a Gmail account, and someone else may have, a, uh, well, I don't know if people still have AOL accounts, um, but it all works. I can send email to anyone if I get their uh, 
uh, email address. And not only that, but I can use any mail reader to read email. So I can use uh, Apple Mail, uh, someone may use Outlook or Thunderbird or Gmail, and it all works. And the reason for that is very simple, is that email is not defined by uh, interface uh, or uh, by having to have your uh, email on a particular server. It's defined by your protocol. And any client uh, that speaks the protocol can communicate. Now, fast forward, uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all of these, well, if you don't have an account and address on one of these services, you cannot talk to the other people on that service. Um, moreover, they like having all your data on their servers, not on, on your machine. My email is on my machine. It moves with me. When I'm on a plane, I still have email access. Um, but all of these social networks uh, have gotten rid of that. And you may say, well, there's very good reasons for doing it, maybe business reasons or other reasons, but uh, you know, Twitter for a while had an open API so you could build your own Twitter client. And then they decided it was a threat to their business, so they shut it down. So I think this is telling something that you know, uh, these companies in general don't want the user to be in control. And same thing with uh, uh, documents. It used to be that in the good old word of Unix, uh, when we only had a command line interface, uh, everything was a text file, and I could edit a, a text file with any editor I wanted. But then this changed when things like Word and other programs came in, uh, that suddenly you could only edit Word documents with the Word application. So it puts you in a walled garden. And then now we have the cloud, and the cloud, they want your data. So you don't own your data, you don't own the access to your data, whether you go to Dropbox, to uh, Google Docs, to uh, uh, I don't know what's the other logo here. Uh, any one of these, they have a different interface to navigate your files, uh, which are all more crappy than the one you have on your desktop, and you don't have any control over that. And finally, uh, staying with Linux, uh, Unix, or Linux for the younger ones, uh, with Unix, you had this philosophy that you build little tools that you can combine uh, at length. So you can combine the script to filter some data, uh, otherwise to format it, another one to do some data analysis on it, and you could create your own scripts based on that. And instead of that, these days, well, you have apps that are, again, these walled gardens that uh, uh, come, up, come with a set of features, and you don't have a choice. Uh, if something is not in the app, well, either you have to buy another one, uh, or you just don't do it. Um, and of course, uh, there are many features. Uh, we've recently done a study of users of Word uh, with uh, legal professionals who should be able to use features like numbering paragraphs. Numbering paragraphs sounds like a fancy feature, right? They don't use it because they don't trust it, because sometimes it does weird things, and so they prefer numbering things and renumber things by hand. So not only we have uh, apps with a limited, well, with a, a defined set of features, uh, but apparently they're not the right ones because people don't use them. Uh, and the wall gardens and the information silos are colliding with things like uh, Microsoft 360 or uh, iCloud or, uh, uh, or, or Google Docs where it's both the app that you have to use and the data that is not yours anymore. So the net result of that is uh, there is a definitive lack of flexibility People struggle to use these apps. Now, when I say people struggle, you guys don't because you're, you know, I'm assuming a lot of you are HCI students or practitioners, and so you know the stuff. You use computers because you like computers. Uh, but most people don't. They use computers because they have to. And so they, they fight their systems all the time. Uh, users have a very hard time appropriating their tools, uh, using them in a way that fits their work practices rather than the one that was in the heads of the of the designers or the programmers of the tool. And so, uh, uh, like my wife Wendy Mackay says, software is not soft. Uh, and we should think about this, because if something should be soft, it is software. I mean, it should be easier to do software uh, in different colors and size and number of seats than it is to make cars in different colors and size and number of seats, right? Um, and yet, it's not the case. So, how do we try to address this, uh, this issue that uh, we lack the flexibility uh, that uh, users want to uh, mix and match functionality, to own their data, uh, and to create their own digital environment? 
Well, the first thing is, I think we have to get away from these uh, silos and say that you know, we need more openness in the app. One app is not enough to do uh, uh, a single task, uh, but at the same time, we also juggle multiple devices, and uh, one device is not enough. We need to combine multiple devices in a lot, with a lot more flexibility than we are able to do it uh, today. And finally, we should once and for all recognize that all, most of the stuff we do with computers is uh, collective uh, in a sense or another, and so one user is not enough. But current software is designed for one user using one computer in one setting to do one thing at a time. Um, and so, uh, this gets me to uh, the uh, name of my project. I call my project ONE, which is the acronym of ONE is not enough. And yes, I'm pretty proud of it. Sorry. <laughs> um, now, the, thing is, the reason it's called WAD is because there is a subtitle, and the subtitle is Unified Principles of Interaction. And this is one of these projects supported by the European Union uh, under the uh, ERC program, the uh, European Research Council. Uh, so this sounds like uh, a weird uh, uh, way to, to say that to support diversity, in fact, we need unification. Uh, when we interact with the physical world, uh, we are very good at appropriating things. Uh, if I need to write on a piece of paper, I'm going to go for a pen. But uh, if I want to cut something, I can go for scissors or a knife. But I can find other tools that are appropriate because they have the right properties. And so, these properties that rely on, on the laws of physics in the physical world, right? So we are very good at uh, looking at objects for what they were made for, writing or something, uh, but we're also very good at looking at objects for what they are made of and what you can make with them given their properties. But in the digital world, we learn that things do one thing, and if we don't use it in the way it was prescribed, it just doesn't work. So I'll give you examples of this. Um, but before I get there, um, how do we uh, identify, in a sense, the laws of information uh, that would underlie our uh, digital world in the same way as the laws of physics underlie the physical world? And so that's where I think we need more theory-driven HCI. Um, there is a series of articles uh, that I really encourage you to, to read in, in, in CHI and in interactions that have been Going back again and again, why is there you know, more theory in HCI? Uh, and some people are saying, we don't need theory in HCI. Uh, I think we need theory. And um, this is extracted from, um, again, uh, uh, Wendy's, uh, uh, Wendy Mackay and, and Laure Fayard's uh, paper from 1997 uh, in DIS on triangulation across discipline, where uh, she analyzes the fact that in natural sciences, uh, of course you have theory uh, and you have observations. And you uh, either start with observation and then abstract theory out of there and then refine it with further observations, or we start with theory and then you try to prove or disprove it and then you refine your theory. Uh, and okay, different sciences work different way, but you go back and forth. Now, in HCI, like in other uh, engineering fields, uh, fields that create uh, new artifacts, there is a third strand, which is that we use both theory and observation to create a new thing that we put out in the world uh, that changes the world. Um, and so we need to both uh, draw uh, design of the artifact from observations, and we know all the methods we use uh, from you know, need finding with users and participatory design and other things. Um, but I think we don't do enough in terms of using theory to drive this design. So, uh, is that, okay, I think I was on the wrong side. So, um, so my point here is that we, we have a lot of design methods uh, out there, and I'm sure all of you use these, me these methods to find out about users and to uh, do user-centered design. What I propose is that we address this other layer of how to make what I call design principles or generative principles to support generative theory to have ways to uh, create new artifacts based on a theory, not just on an idea or uh, an intuition or uh, uh, an idea coming, coming out of, uh, um, of observing users. Doesn't mean that's not uh, something we shouldn't do, but with generative theory uh, and design principles, I think we can uh, create better systems. 
and systems that would rely on these uh, underlying principles, I think will be more likely to be interoperable and, and more flexible. So let me uh, give you two examples of design principles we've been uh, playing with over the years. Um, the first one, for those of you who know me, uh, won't be very surprised. It's about uh, human tool use and what I call instrumental interaction. So uh, getting back to what I was saying earlier, the way we interact with the physical world to make things uh, is essentially through physical action. And uh, what happens is that physical action very often is mediated by tools. We do very few things with our bare hands. Um, so we use pens for writing and uh, cooking utensils and uh, woodworking tools and uh, mobility instruments like the bike. Uh, we are very good at making tools. We are making also tools for making tools and etc. In fact, uh, human tool use can be traced uh, back 3.3 million years. Uh, I'm not sure the, the humans at the time looked quite like that. Uh, for the younger ones, uh, this is uh, from the movie Yes, 2001, a Space Odyssey, uh, where this ape here discovers that this uh, bone uh, can be used as a weapon. Um, so human tool uses traced 3.3 million years back. It probably has had some influence on the way of how our uh, cognitive system works. They found traces not only of tool making sites, uh, like you know, breaking stones to make them sharp, but also sites that, because the, the, the remnants of it are uh, less well-finished uh, uh, objects, were used to teach their children to make the tools. So very early on, we were able to make tools and to teach to make tools, which uh, is not found in any other uh, animal species. Uh, there are animals that use tools, appropriate objects as tools, but teaching uh, uh, others to use tools, uh, we haven't seen. So I think we have something that is very uh, deeply in, in our brain of uh, uh, interacting with the uh, environment through the use and the, the design and the use of tools. Um, interestingly, in the, in the HCI literature or the, the psychology literature that is often used in HCI, tool use is not very present. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, James Gibson, ecological uh, uh, theory, uh, ecological perception. Uh, this is his definition of affordances, which is the right definition, by the way, if you, you know, um, don't be misled by imitations. <laughs> so the right definition of an affordance is that um, it's what the environment uh, has to offer to the animal, including the human, what it provides or furnishes either for good or ill. Um, and so it's the idea that uh, when you, when you uh, are faced with, we're in, in certain environments, some objects have some capabilities. So some objects have the capability that I can sit on, on them because they have the right height and resistance to my weight so I can sit without uh, breaking it. Um, there are three lines in uh, Gibson's book about tool use, where he says, hmm, why well, tool use? That's kind of interesting. Uh, tools are this detached object that you can attach to your body. Something like that. And, then, and that's all uh, he says about it, which I, I find a little bit frustrating. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that uh, Gibson was married to Eleanor Gibson, who was a famous uh, developmental psychologist, uh, not very uh, well known in HCI circles. Uh, she's the one who came up with the notion of visual cliff. Uh, and I don't know if you know this experiment of visual cliff. Uh, so you see this device there where you put a, a young uh, kid, uh, can, a kid who can crawl, um, and on the other side of this, uh, what looks like a hole but in fact has a piece of glass that would support the weight of the baby, uh, you put the mother on the other side and you tell the mother, get your baby to come to you. Now if we follow Gibson, the environment has the affordance to support the weight of the baby, but the baby won't go. By three months old, they've learned that if they perceive a visual cliff, they shouldn't go there, right? And that's the link between the notion of affordances and notion of signifiers that our friend Don Norman has, uh, is now using to uh, refer to what he used to call affordances, and that's often references as a, referenced as affordances in HCI, which is uh, an affordance is only uh, good if you can perceive it. Uh, if I see a chair that looks like it's made of paper, uh, I, uh, even if it's 
built to support my weight, I won't sit on it because I won't perceive that it has suitability uh, for me. Uh, but again, that doesn't say anything about tool use. Uh, and so what, what these theories look at is really some, some basic uh, principles of how we perceive the capabilities of, of the environment. What I find fascinating and very interesting with tool use is that tool use redefined, redefines the affordances of the environment. Once this ape, do we have the ape here? Yes. Once this ape has this thing in his hand, uh, suddenly the world is looking better for him, right? So uh, I've been interested recently in looking at uh, the writings of a, a French uh, psychologist who studies human tool use and has this theory of uh, technical reasoning. Uh, because what interests me is not uh, using tools for what they are made for, because that's something you learn, and once you learn how a pen works, you know that a pen can write. That, to me, is not very interesting. What's interesting is that you can use a pen for other uses without having ever learned that it can be used for other things. Uh, and so it's a theory of technical reasoning is that we simulate in our head the interaction between the tool and the hand and between the tool and the object uh, in terms of uh, complementary properties of the tool and the object, in terms of the actions we can do on the object through manipulation of the tool, um, and it is because of the fact that we uh, uh, look at things or conceive of things at the level of their properties, uh, not their uh, predefined function, that we can use uh, a knife to, as a screwdriver, that we can use a fork to stir a cup of coffee, or that we can use a corkscrew to, uh, to, um, uh, to make a mark in a piece of wood. It's because we, are, we have a goal in, in our head, uh, and we create these chains of, of from my hand to the uh, object with tools in between uh, that will achieve uh, the uh, wanted effect based on the properties of these tools and what we know of the effects of, of our physical actions on these tools. And this is uh, uh, supported, in fact, by uh, neurobiological evidence on the power of tools as uh, uh, changing the body schema. Uh, and this is what we were talking about this morning. Uh, studies uh, have been conducted on, uh, not uh, just on humans, but on, uh, I don't know if they were chimpanzees or what uh, type of uh, uh, monkeys? Macaques. Um, uh, looking at, at, uh, at their uh, brain activity, uh, when you look at an object in front of you, you don't have to try to reach for it to know if it's reachable or not, right? So we have neurons that fire when uh, uh, the object you're uh, focusing on uh, is reachable and they don't fire if it's not reachable. Now, the minute I put a stick in your hand and you hold the stick so you can assess its, its, its length through the lever effect and all that, suddenly an object that was not accessible and didn't fire those neurons is going to fire for the objects that become accessible through the stick. So it's literally the case that my arm gets longer when I hold the stick. And I think it's a very strong basis uh, for uh, a tool-based interaction, which is that tools really extend our capability uh, not just figuratively, but quite literally. And of course, kids are very good at uh, testing the, uh, the capabilities of tools. If you give them a piece of chalk and uh, a wall in their bedroom, they will uh, uh, turn it into something interesting. So we're in a situation where the physical world is uh, quite flexible. Uh, here, if I show those pictures, you instantly see a pencil, you instantly see a mug. But in a different context, you're going to see a ruler because you know, you've all drawn a straight line using a pen as a ruler. Uh, or you see a paperweight because there is a uh, wind in the office and you, you put the, the mug on the, on the pile of paper. You don't even think twice about it. Now, this flexibility of the, of the physical world, again, relies on the underlying uh, uh, properties of these objects. The pen is straight and rigid. The paperweight is uh, heavy and uh, stands by itself. Uh, but when you go to digital objects, then it's, it's all gone. Uh, Word will only ever edit Word documents. Uh, it won't ever let you do things like this. It won't ever let you do things like that. Now, when we shift to the digital world, we lose a lot of these capabilities. Now, there are counterexamples, and I think it's interesting to look at them. 
One of them is uh, um, spreadsheets. Spreadsheets is probably the program is probably the program that has been the most uh, appropriated by its uh, users. It was designed to do these boring things of adding numbers and uh, creating uh, cheesy uh, 3D pie charts. Um, but people have done things like this. They've done uh, animated ninja turtles in, in Excel. Uh, they've done this visualization of the population, move of population in, in New York City uh, along the day. Uh, they've created this uh, game called Arena, which is a strategy game. I don't understand the, the rules, but entirely done in Excel. And this has been done by people who don't have particular skills as programmers or anything like this. So there are examples of digital tools that have been uh, appropriated successfully by users. Um, so as I was saying, a uh, big gap between physical and digital tools. Uh, when you are, say, a graphic artist is, is doing uh, some, some work, you see this desk, there's all these tools around there, it can use and appropriate them in, in whichever way it wants. And when I'm using uh, my software to do the same thing, I struggle uh, using the tools that were given to me and that I don't have uh, the opportunity to, to replace, to change, or to improve. So it is all these observations that, that, that led me to think about, well, can we have the power of tool use in the digital world? And that's what led to instrumental interaction. And so the idea is that in, instrumental interaction tools mediate uh, the interaction between the user and the uh, um, for a long time I've used the term the object of interest in, in reference to, to Ben Schneiderman, uh, notion of object of interest in, di in uh, direct manipulation. Uh, and so in the same way that I use a pen to write on a piece of paper in the physical world, well in a digital world we use tools. Well first on desktops we, well we had mice, now we have trackpads. Uh, we have these objects on the screens, the scroll bars, the menus, all these uh, little widgets that are mediating our interaction with the object we really want to manipulate, such as here using a scroll bar to navigate a, a, a document. And in fact, this uh, notion of tool has been uh, quite uh, uh, you know, developed in a certain set of interfaces, not, most notably the uh, interfaces for creating drawings and things like this. Um, we have examples here at the top. It's been used also in the, in the tangible interaction, if, if you want to call it that, uh, with, the, with the remote uh, that you can turn into a golf club or a tennis racket or, or, or steering wheel uh, to you know, give you a better sense of, of controlling a, a particular uh, online game. So, so in a sense, there is this idea that uh, instrumental interaction can be a good thing, at least. Maybe it doesn't solve all the problems, but it can be a good thing. Now, the question is, how do we design instrumental interfaces? How do we uh, create interfaces that, uh, uh, how do we invent the, the right digital tools um, for, for creating this flexibility that I was uh, uh, talking about? So, uh, for the past, uh, and it's been a number of years that we've been working on this, and we came up with principles that we have applied again and again and that we teach our students that have proved really, really effective. Um, and the first one is uh, uh, reification. And the idea of reification is, is turning things into an object. Um, and I see Haijun here who defended his thesis yesterday on object-oriented drawing and other tools is created that are excellent examples of uh, uh, objectification or, or in, in my words, uh, reification. Uh, and it's a very powerful uh, thing, and I uh, encourage you to read it, see this. Um, one of our best uh, example is the work we did on, on uh, uh, magnetic guidelines on helping uh, graphic designers to align and distribute visually objects on the screen, which is a task they do again and again and again. And right now, you know how it works. You know the little uh, dialog box on the left. Uh, you select several objects and you go in a menu or in this uh, uh, set of tools, you click one thing and then your objects move in a rather unpredictable way. You don't know if they're gonna align on the one on the top, the one at the bottom. Uh, and uh, when you move one object, then the alignment is lost. So usually you get the reflex of reselecting everything to move them as a group. Maybe you group them together, but once you group them together, then you cannot access easily each of the individual objects. People struggle with that. We work with a graphic designer and we observe him and he's doing this uh, very expertly, but uh, uh, spending a lot of time doing it. So what does reification do for us here? Well, the command, the concept is alignment. I want to turn the notion of alignment into an object. Well, in the physical world, if you want to align things, you can push them with a ruler or you can uh, put them on the stick. Uh, so we created the magnetic guideline. 
Uh, that's something that actually was uh, in a paper that uh, I published in uh, 2000. Uh, it took us uh, 15 years to find a student to, to push that concept uh, further than what we had done. And so a couple of years ago, we had a paper at WIST on something called uh, sticky lines. And uh, here's the, the video. Well, the problem is the video is not playing on my computer, and I need to live comment, so I'm going to try like this. So sticky... No. <laughs> da, 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 what happened? Um, yes, so you create a line, then you move objects, they stick to the line, you move the sticky line, uh, they stick to it. Uh, then you say, now I want to distribute objects, so it will distribute as you move objects in and out of the line. You can distribute uh, along the center, the left, the right. Uh, you can also have the line automatically snap objects that are, happen to already be on there. Uh, you can align to vertical and horizontal lines at the same time. And then uh, you can also uh, grab objects as you go, so you can snap the objects to the line rather than the other way around. The system can uh, predict possible alignments uh, like current tools already do, but it creates a sticky line if you drop your object at that moment, so then you can maintain this uh, alignment. Um, then you can uh, play further and realize that in some cases you don't want the alignment uh, given by the bounding box, you want to adjust it. We call it a tweak. This purple uh, little thing you saw there is a tweak applied to this object to give it a proper visual alignment. And the tweak is reified. It's an object. I can copy it. I can paste it. And then the other object has borrowed the same adjustment. Uh, it remembers the tweak if I move it to another uh, line here. And I can delete uh, the tweak like I delete any other object. We do the same thing for the bounding box. So visually, this bounding box makes no sense. I want to reduce it to this. Uh, uh, circle in the middle, and now this is what uh, decides on the alignment uh, for left and right. I can copy it to that other object. Of course, it ends up in the wrong place, but I can move that uh, to adjust it. And then I have objects that have a visually satisfying alignment. If I use distribution of objects, of course, it will use uh, the bounding box that I adjust. So here I'm going to adjust it left and right, and the other objects uh, realign. Uh, finally, uh, we can go beyond just lines, so we can have objects aligned around circles, or in fact, we could do, of course, uh, any shape. We can also align objects around an existing object. Uh, here we go, where you can uh, set the, the distance uh, from the uh, original object. We can have lines that are uh, in any direction. Uh, and I think the last piece that I want to show is that we can also control the distribution function uh, when you do distribution. So if you go to this uh, sigmoid function, uh, now the objects are uh, further apart in the middle than on the side. So you control uh, different uh, ways of uh, distributing the objects. So all of this was done by this simple idea of a line that has some special properties when you use it uh, in connection with uh, graphical objects. And of course, it can align objects, but it could align windows, it could align your icons, it could uh, do other things. So that illustrates the power of one principle, reification, to make things uh, easier to understand. You've seen this video once, you know how to use the tool. Um, the second uh, principle that we've been using a lot is, is polymorphism. Uh, and I think that's a key to, to making our systems more powerful. Our systems, they tend to make assumption that you're going to use uh, one function for one type of content and that's it. Polymorphism in, in programming languages is when a function can apply to objects of different types, where you only require that it maybe an object has a position. So anything can be aligned, for example, with my sticky line if the object has a position. So it could be the clips in the video editing a, 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 a tool, or it could be anything if it has a position. So we want to make the instruments work with different types of, of, of content. Um, and this is very frustrating currently because, for example, every um, creation, creation uh, tool out there has a different uh, type of color palette. And so if I like the one from Photoshop, which is the second one here, and I want to use it uh, with Excel, well, I'm stuck. It just won't work, right? Because it's strapped inside Photoshop. So we want to extract those uh, tools from their uh, from their world garden of an application so that they can interoperate. And I should be able to use any coloring tool, palette or other kind of coloring tool, with any type of object that has a color, period. And in terms of, of I mean, you know, uh, there are computer scientists in the room, it is not rocket science. 
right? <laughs> uh, it's called duct typing. Uh, so, so we know how to do it, but, but we just don't make the effort of uh, building our systems based on these principles. So we actually studied uh, how uh, graphic designers um, uh, use color, and we found that they were using colors in, in, in ways that were really not matching the tools that were given in, in, uh, in, in current systems. Um, so this is a, a system called Color uh, Portraits, where we uh, studied the, the, the practices of uh, designers, graphic designers, and other type of creators. Uh, and one of the things that came up is that the, the color swatches that are in the corner of, of, uh, of Illustrator or Photoshop are very frustrating because you cannot test the colors in context. So we did something very simple. We turned those swatches into rectangles you can resize and move and uh, reorder. So your color palette now is an object, full-fledged object, where you can judge a color in the context of another color. It's very simple. Uh, it's an application in the sense of, of both uh, uh, reification and polymorphism, but I won't get into the details. Um, so the idea here is that once you have uh, applied a, or, or, uh, or figured out something that works in, in, in different contexts, it's, it's useful to try to abstract it out into a principle that then you can apply to other things. And then uh, when we design new interfaces these days, we always think about, okay, so how to make it, uh, how, what is there to reify? What are the things that are in the user's head that they want to do? Can we turn them into objects? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't matter. Every time it gives us ideas that we didn't have before. Um, I don't think I have, uh, do I want to show this one? Uh, so this other one was uh, uh, also uh, interesting because they experiment a lot with color. So they try things, they want to undo, redo, and, and so either they do that in a different uh, uh, document or on the sides of the document. So we created a system, the Color Partner, that generates colors for you. It interpolates randomly uh, among the, uh, the colors you set in the beginning, and then these disks sort of uh, fade out unless you click on them which means, oh, you're interesting, so I want to keep you, and the system keeps generating around that color, and then you can also delete them, and have this kind of partnership where uh, you're exploring a, a large design space uh, through your own actions, uh, but also through the uh, suggestions from the system. Um, so the, the, the third system, we, the third principle we use a lot is, is called reuse. Uh, I, I don't have time to go into it uh, today, but it's also something that people want to do all the time. Uh, reuse what they've done or redo what they've done before in a different context. And yes, we have the redo command, you have, we have uh, a copy and paste, we have uh, this history windows, but these are very, very limited. And uh, there's also a lot of things that they don't uh, consider in their history, which are a number of uh, um, actions that don't affect the objects, but uh, Undoing a drag, for example, is, is difficult, or undoing a scroll uh, usually is not done. So I think we should consider the history as a first-class object that you should be able to manipulate with the proper tools. Now, in all this research, we, for many years, we, we worked around these principles, and we found that they were very useful. Uh, but there was always this notion of the object of interest, what it is we are interacting with. Uh, and one day, we decided we needed to dig into that. What are the properties of these objects that we interact with that are uh, necessary for this uh, interoperability, this flexibility to work. And so we came up with uh, this uh, notion of uh, uh, substrate. Um, now, the word substrate is used in, in many fields of, uh, of science and engineering. Uh, in biology, it's the nourishing environment for uh, a living organism, something that nourishes uh, the, uh, the plant. In, uh, in material science, it's a supporting substrate so you can lay out other materials on top of it. And I think in digital world, we, we, we use information substrates. Uh, when I see this uh, uh, score on the left, uh, it is a piece of paper, it has some marks on it, the staff, uh, and because it has this structure, this visual organization, I know that the black dots are notes and I can read the notes. Now, if you imagine this without the staff, you don't even know it's a melody, right? Um, on the right, we have something a lot less structured, but you can imagine the painter that created this palette uh, had something in his head of why he organized the colors in this particular way, because he was anticipating mixing them in, in, in various ways. And so, 
Interestingly, the, the, the systems that we find people appropriate the more uh, efficiently these days are those where the, uh, there is a rich information substrate already. The spreadsheet, uh, the arrows here, uh, the blue arrows, are the dependencies between the cells. And when you create your spreadsheet, you don't see them, but somehow you have them in your head. Uh, in fact, seeing them can be useful uh, when to debug and all that. Uh, but it's because there is this richness that, in fact, you can use the, the, the spreadsheet for many different types of things. On the right, we have the same thing with layers in, in Photoshop and Illustrator and all these tools uh, that people have used in, in unexpected ways to do like flip chart books, to, to simulate animation for HCI, to, to do uh, other things than what they were designed for. So I think if we have rich substrates, then we can have rich tools as well that work with those uh, substrates. So the way I define a substrate is something that has a structure and structure. That's the key uh, word. Uh, and it hosts some content. And, and the content acquires meaning from being in that uh, structure. And then you can add internal rules, uh, mapping rules, so you can map one substrate onto another, uh, different relationships to constrain the things and make it uh, um, fit your particular uh, needs. So the way I see the, the, the relationship between uh, substrates and tools is getting back to what I was saying earlier about the, the, the physical world. Uh, as I said, this is not just a pencil. Uh, it's made of some material. It's made itself of molecules and, and atoms. Uh, and so if uh, I have a need that is not to write, uh, I will check these properties of the material, maybe at the molecular level, maybe I can, you know, maybe I need to burn it if I <laughs> uh, need to uh, start a fire or something. Uh, so it has all these levels of interpretation. I can look at it as an object, as a material. I can also look at it uh, at a higher abstraction level as something that enables some, some um, practices, some use, uh, maybe a cultural content, uh, context, sorry. And so I think we constantly uh, uh, interpret objects in the world around us at this level, uh, different levels of interpretation. And in fact, we have the same thing in the digital world. I mean, computing most of the time is turning one representation into another, right? And so for example, I have this table of data. I want to say, well, I'm gonna turn it into a, a graph, a particular line graph or uh, here histogram. Then that gets turned into geometrical shapes and that in the end turn, gets turned into pixels that are the things that I see on the screen. But when I look at the screen, what am I seeing? Am I seeing the pixels? Am I seeing the shapes? Or am I seeing the data in the table? Well, it depends. It depends. Sometimes I want to see it as a set of shapes so I can play with them. Uh, I'm sure people here have uh, you know, generated uh, uh, data from their experiment, uh, got a, a graph out of it, and uh, when it came time to paste it into their Kai paper, eh, it didn't quite fit, so I go into Illustrator, I adjust a little things, uh, so I suddenly, it's not the data itself that I'm manipulating, it's the shape. Um, and so I think the relationship between the substrates and the instruments is that for different levels in this stack of representations, uh, I can have a, uh, a different type of tool. So I can paint pixels on top of it, maybe I want to annotate, uh, I may want to uh, edit the shapes. Uh, maybe it won't let me edit the height of the bars because that would be cheating, uh, but maybe I can uh, do other edits. Uh, and I can also edit the table at the bottom, in which case, of course, all these levels must stay in, thing, in sync, uh, which raises interesting uh, uh, CS problems. So I think it's because we can play with these different levels of representation that we can have tools that are more polymorphic, that will work with different types of content as, as long as they can find the right level to, uh, to manipulate the, uh, the substrate or the object of interest. Uh, we, again, we've worked with uh, uh, designers to uh, understand how they, uh, how they manage in their heads the design they have when they do graphic design for a new book uh, or, or a new document. And uh, we found that they actually uh, have in their heads uh, what we call graphical substrates. Uh, graphic design, you know, they say you have to use the grid. Uh, well, they don't use the grid so much, uh, especially when you do creative graphic design. But they have other rules in their heads. We had a designer who had based his whole design on the number 42. Uh, 
so all the spaces, the font sizes, the color, the RGB codes of the colors were multiples of 42. Uh, and of course, he had to do all the calculations by hand on the side be before interacting with the tool. So we created uh, different uh, prototypes here, I don't have time to, to get into details, to, um, uh, to let them play with this relationship so it could create their own relationships if you wish, having a sort of a spreadsheet kind of thing, but inside Illustrator, uh, so you could say, well, the position of this is calculated based on the length of the text or the position of that other object. And they created a bunch of uh, interesting designs uh, based on that. Now, the last uh, uh, principle in, in that whole thing on, on tool use is uh, the, the notion of universal sharing. Um, I think the way we talk about sharing these days is really misleading because when we say sharing, uh, we say copying and sending copies around, right? When you share something on Facebook, uh, you're not sharing it, you're giving it away. It's, to me, it's not exactly the same. Uh, now, the thing is, digital information has this particularity that, that it can be uh, in different places at once, uh, whereas in the physical world, you know, if I have a book, I have the book. If I give it to you, I don't have it anymore. And so there is a, a, a cognitive, uh, um, I would say, uh, problem there in that we are not used to this property of information that it can be in different places at the same time. So, so what would it mean to have universal sharing? So we created this system with uh, uh, our colleagues from um, University of Aarhus uh, and also from uh, Telecom called WebStraits. And WebStraits essentially shares the DOM of a web page in real time between all the people who are viewing that web page. Uh, and so here we see, you see the same document with two different uh, views, uh, sort of one column and then the final layout. Here someone is drawing a, a, a figure. You can see it show up on the tablet and also on the screen. They'd use different editors. Uh, on the left, then someone can beautify this drawing and, and turn it into a, a proper uh, a vector graphics. Uh, and it shows up on, on everybody's uh, screen that sharing this part of the document. Um, and in this system, the tools themselves are objects you can share. So here we have a citing tool, so I can write in the bottom right uh, the keyword Wiser. I click on cite, it includes a reference to uh, Wiser's paper, a uh, famous paper on ubiquitous computing. The set of references is itself a document, so if I were to update the reference in there, it would update in the other document as well. Um, and from that, we have the idea that the document or the editor are the same thing. So I can take this citing button, get the piece of HTML, open my friend's uh, editor, paste that piece of HTML there, and now he has a cite button in his editor. So the same way I can copy-paste a piece of text, I can copy-paste a piece of, uh, uh, well, what I would call here an instrument for citing things. And this side instrument, we can then uh, paste it into, uh, for example, uh, a slide a presentation tool if we want to add present a, uh, uh, references to a, to a slide. Um, so we actually created the entire paper that was published at WIST with the system itself, including the final PDF is printed from the web page. Um, so this simple idea, again, uh, when you push it as far as you can, this idea that you synchronize the DOM, uh, all of the DOM, but nothing but the DOM, uh, gives you a lot of power in terms of uh, mixing documents with interfaces or with editors. Uh, and through the principle of transclusion, uh, we have the ability to uh, ha insert a piece of a document inside another uh, document and have all of these uh, live uh, uh, all the time without depending on a particular uh, uh, company or provider giving you the, the uh, the, the system, you can run this on your machine and, and share it uh, easily. Okay, so this is going, of course, uh, uh, faster than I wanted. Uh, I had a second example here that I'm going to run through very quickly because um, I've, I've talked about instrument interaction uh, on many occasions, um, and uh, these are principles in the sense that come from uh, experience with running participatory design workshops uh, and also from some uh, theory that are from psychology. Uh, recently we worked with a specialist of information theory uh, and we tried to apply some ideas coming from information theory to the design of interactive systems. Um, so I don't know, uh, I don't have time to go into details of information theory, but essentially the principle that we developed is the notion of maximizing the information gain. 
So when you interact with a system, when you interact with a system, you have a, a goal in mind, uh, and then uh, the system has some prior knowledge about uh, the likelihood of each of these goals, like reaching a particular file or a particular target on the map. Um, and so you are uh, getting uh, so information from the system, and you're providing input, and the goal is to reduce the uncertainty of the system down to zero. That's when you reach your target, you reach your goal. And if we choose a better type of feedback from the system, maybe the input can provide more information so as to reduce the uncertainty faster and get you to your goal more quickly. So it's a type of human-computer partnership where, in fact, uh, we're not telling the system to guess what we're doing, but we are telling the system to challenge us so we give the system the most useful information for it to get uh, to the target I have in my head that the system, of course, doesn't know. So there's a little bit of, of math. Uh, looks serious, uh, base rules, uh, the formula for entropy and information gain. I will illustrate it very quickly on a, on a, on a short example, which was uh, map navigation. So suppose you're in Denver. This is when Kai was in Denver. That's why the <laughs> this is the example. So you're viewing the area near Denver, and you want to navigate towards New York. But of course, the system doesn't know you want to go there. And the only thing you can do is go in one of the eight cardinal directions or uh, stay where you are, meaning zoom in. It's in there, but I'm not telling you exactly where. So you have very limited type of input compared to map navigation. Um, now, when you go to the right, uh, of course, if you're in Denver, you want to go to New York, you want to go to the right, uh, the system now has to choose, OK, what new view am I going to show the user? Now, you may be tempted to say the big one on the right, because it has all the four cities, the main cities on the right, so your goal is in there. But that's a stupid choice, because the system already knows there is very high probability that your target is in there, right? So it's more clever for the system to give you this view, because then your next move is going to be either going to the right, going to the left, or going inside the current view, which will tell it if it's the right, it's most likely New York. If it's the left, it's uh, Kansas City. Uh, and if it's the middle, there's still two possibilities. So the system is, is challenging you, in a sense, uh, but that means that the information you give it is more uh, valuable to it. And we ran an experiment with this. This is an example of what happens when you navigate uh, from the map of Europe towards Paris. So I go right, poof, it takes me near London and Paris, because these are big cities. I said, no, it's to the south. I zoomed out uh, because it could have been Rome, but then I go up again. You know it was not London or unlikely to be London, so it zooms into Paris. We tested that. It was 40% faster than the traditional navigation technique. I mean, 40%, right? Uh, we applied the same technique to file navigation with a slightly different interface. Again, it was up to 40% faster. Uh, the, user didn't the users or the participants didn't necessarily like it. <laughs> <laughs> because it is un kind of unpredictable, so there's work to do at the uh, interaction level to, to reveal more of what the system is about to do. Uh, but I think it's an example where uh, these principles of maximizing information gain can be applied to different areas, uh, and in fact, since then, we've applied it to a third, uh, a third project, and it has worked also very efficiently uh, for in music environment, uh, and it's a very powerful principle. OK, so uh, time now to uh, wrap up. I had something here on uh, large wall displays. Uh, I, think, I think this is the future. I think you know we've put computers in our pockets and wrists and, and, and on our uh, eyes. Uh, that's nice. I don't think we can go much further in that direction. Having interactive environments, I think, is still an, an open challenge. And I think we need these uh, concepts of substrates and tools to, uh, to be able to build these uh, this, uh, interfaces. So I won't show you uh, the stuff we have done, but you can easily find the, uh, the papers. Uh, so let me wrap this up in uh, less than two minutes. <laughs> um, so the conclusion is, you know, I think the, the, the challenge of making uh, interactive systems uh, fit for human use is a very old idea. And I always cite uh, Engelbart and his notion of augmenting human intellect. Um, there are very tough challenges on the way, 
uh, I think the, the operating systems we have are really crappy for the kind of things we need to do these days with, uh, with interaction. I think the programming languages are even worse, if anything. Um, and so there are some very interesting computer science problems there in building the right uh, infrastructure for interaction rather than for computation uh, as it's been done until now. I also think we have great opportunities with all these new uh, modalities that I talked about or, or interaction styles, uh, voice, tangible, VR, uh, I think can be addressed with the same type of ideas I talked about. Um, but what worries me is that, you know, we were uh, told once that we had a future in UbiComp or we had a future being Tom Cruise, you know, uh, harnessing the world around us with a few gestures. Uh, and then we were told, uh, no, you're going to have, you know, AI in your body that's going to empower you uh, like uh, Iron Man here. Uh, we're being told, no, we're not going to have to drive the car. Well, you're not going to have to drive the car unless it does something stupid and instantly you have to correct the mistakes of the car, uh, otherwise you get killed. So there's all this push with AI these days to make the systems do things for us instead of us, sometimes against us. So what's happening is this. What's happening, uh, and you heard the expression human in the loop, what's happening is they want us to be slaves to the machine, right? Uh, and we talk a lot to AI people, uh, and we tell them, you know, when you say human in the loop, it means you need a human to make your algorithms better. Uh, that's not what I want. What I want is AI system to make me better, right? And so that's what uh, we call the computer in the loop. Uh, what we're being promised, in a sense, is this world where everything is going to be done for us. So, you know, we just have to sit, watch YouTube videos, drink uh, Coke, and, uh, and wait for our uh, self-driving uh, chair to go somewhere in the, uh, in the city. Um, I don't think this is a very uh, interesting future. So the thing I tell my students is you you are born in a world with these uh, tools around you all the time. So you take them for granted. Uh, if you are an HCI student, you should be able to forget everything you know about interfaces uh, in order to reinvent new things. You cannot invent new things if you try to just extend what has been uh, done uh, so far. I think we've reached the limits of, of GUIs and, and uh, even touch interfaces if we don't sort of step back and try to reinvent from scratch. So. Uh, get a, a flash of the neuralizer uh, to erase from your memory what you know about interfaces uh, and design for uh, the unexpected. I will uh, leave it here. Thank you. Uh, we have time for just a couple of questions. Let's wave for a microphone. Uh, so, oh, there we go. Thank you for a very uh, inspiring talk, uh, Michelle. Uh, this reminds me a little bit of uh, the much uh, maligned Open Doc uh, effort at uh, Apple, right? And I remember using it, and one of the things that, that struck me was that this is uh, just to explain this is like where you basically take a text editor widget and then you can take, you know, a menu widget. You can put them together in your own kind of app, you can design your own app. So. I think the basic problem is that, is that when users start using physical tools for different things, that's like programming. And end user programming has always been the stepchild of UI design. I mean, Alan Kay famously wrote in his Dynabook paper that you know, people will be programming their own <laughs> Dynabook, but nobody programs their own things. So to what extent is that due to the, the software layer or the fact even that it's like Flatland, having the affordance of the glass sort of the, you know, in the baby experiment, the glass, yeah. the glass layer, where users just can't see what's there, and it doesn't matter what kind of affordance you try to program into it, because it's just not there. Whereas with a tool, you can go, oh, haptics, gravity, weight, oh. Well, snatch. but th th that's, I think, the whole challenge, is how, we, how do we create interfaces that are uh, consistent enough in their underlying rules that we can build on learning and getting better at it? I don't expect everybody to be programmers, certainly not, and I don't think this is a, a consequence of this model. OpenDoc failed because it was based on apps. So it was sort of a hack on top of existing applications to make a document-centric environment that, if it had been built from the ground up as a document-centric environment, which uh, the Xerox star was, I think it would have probably more, more likely uh, worked. 
But I think there's two things that, that I hear here. One is the programming versus using tools. Well, programming is, is, is making tools. Uh, and some people will like to do that, uh, and some people won't, uh, and there's plenty of room to use tools made by others. What I want is to be able to go on a, uh, on an, on not on an app store, but on a tool store online and buy my color picker, buy my uh, sticky line, or buy your sticky line if, it's, if I think it's better, and put it in my environment, and it just works. Uh, so I, I was not sure what you were saying about the, the glass thing and the uh, I think the problem that we have today is people don't even try things because they've learned that computers just don't work. Like the baby. Though. Like the baby. Yeah, exactly. Because because we are used that something is done one way in one application, a different way in the other, uh, and then an update comes up and what I learned to do doesn't work anymore. Uh, there are studies out there that show that you know people don't use the new features because they don't trust that they're going to stay long enough for for them to be valuable to them. Uh, so, so that's why I'm talking about unified principles to have this sort of uh, underlying things on, on which you can count, like gravity uh, and other uh, basic features of the physical world. But what these laws of information are, we, we still have to really uh, invent and, and develop. We have time for just one more question. Here. It seems to me that the ecology of all our tools <coughs> is structured by our economy structured by the walled gardens are created by economic interest and it's not evil people it's the nature of our marketplace our economy and do you have any way to break through that structure um, thank you for this question I always have a version of that question in, in this talk so um, and, and uh, so since then I've come up with uh, an answer um, so I think it is disruptive, definitely. So I don't expect uh, the big companies to switch to, to, to a model like that because it's challenging, challenging their business model. Uh, but there has been disruptions in the past. And I think one disruption was the, the App Store, the Apple App Store. You know, when the iPhone came out, uh, Steve Jobs didn't want people to develop their own applications and put them uh, uh, and sell them online. Uh, in the same way, when the Mac came out, it took a while before you had uh, the SDK so you could create your own applications. Uh, so, so the App Store demonstrated that you can make money uh, by selling uh, things for 99 cents. Uh, so I don't, I, I'm not a business person, uh, but I don't see uh, something that is inherently uh, impossible there in terms of uh, the, the economics of it. Uh, it's just a different uh, state of affairs, and I think the way we have left some companies have so much power by owning our data, by uh, dictating the software we use, by updating the software, uh, by not selling software, but just selling software licenses so we never own anything, uh, has given them a lot of power. Uh, how do you solve that? Is it through disruption? Is it through regulation? I don't know, but I think it has happened in the past, and. Uh, uh, as I say here, if we're not the ones trying, I don't think uh, it will come from these other companies. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. So this has been our last Sanders Series Invited Lecture of 2019. We'll see you on February 11th uh, in the downstairs conference space. Thank you for coming. <laughs>